for Kurt's mm -hmm. but I think it's great for the well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to New Way. Thank you so much for being here. This is an incredible evening. We're really excited. It's great to see people in person. It's great to have folks joining us virtually. Um, thank you for making time on your calendars for this. My name is Jake Lewis. I'm one of the community relations managers here at New Way. I have the pleasure of working alongside Amy Steffen, who uh, this event would not be possible without her attention to detail and help. Thank you, Amy. I also feel very fortunate to work with uh, Crystal Caruso and Jessica Hillebrand, who are also on the community relations team. We're fearlessly led by our chief community relations officer, Monique Bourgeois. And um, we're just excited to have everybody here. Also a big thanks before we get started, this evening would not be possible without the support from IT and Dan and his team. So a big thanks to them. Yes. So our, our hope for this evening is that we can all leave feeling a part of, a part of the solution, a part of the conversation, a part of the support. Um, I really think we have a great well-rounded panel that'll help do this. And I'm super excited to see where this conversation goes. We will have some time for questions at the end. So for folks here, please feel, feel free to raise your hand and uh, ask any questions. For folks on Zoom land, we'll be monitoring the chat. And so please um, put your chat, your questions in the chat and we'll definitely get to some of those. So I'd like to introduce the wonderful panel that we have here and thank you for the panel members for all showing up. We so appreciate that. Uh, first off, we have Yusuf Shafi, who is with Alliance Wellness Center in Bloomington. Alliance Wellness Center is a licensed substance use and outpatient and inpatient treatment program. He is a board member of the Minnesota Trauma Project and, a Minis and the Minnesota Recovery Connection. Yusuf's passion is to bring wellness to those affected by addiction and mental health problems. Also here representing Southern Minnesota in Mankato is Brandy Brink. We're thrilled. She is the founder and CEO of Beyond Brink, Recovery, and the program director of peer support and outreach for the Southern Minnesota Harm Reduction Team. Beyond Brink serves the recovery community with housing and peer support for adult men and women. They have peer treatment housing, gender specific and LGBTQIA plus specific housing. Recovery provides peer support services and resource resources navigation to both adolescents and adults and their families. Beyond Brink in collaboration with Minnesota EMS systems form Southern Minnesota Harm Reduction Team. Um, this outreach team provides a 24 seven one call or text number for anyone seeking support or services throughout a 20 county region. We also have from the Northland, Jess Nicola. Um, she's with the Duluth, Duluth Police Substance Use Response Team. Uh, Jess is a peer with 11 years in recovery and the program coordinator of uh, the substance use response team within the Duluth Police Department. Um, CERT is a peer recovery led substance use disorder outreach program focused on opioid overdose survivor outreach. Uh, here in the Twin Cities, representing Minnesota Recovery Connection, Justin McNeil. Justin is a certified peer recovery specialist. He also manages the uh, CPRS and is a project manager. His specific focus is working with justice-involved populations. We're thrilled also to have Dr. Emily Bruner with Gateway Recovery Center here. Dr. Bruner is a board certified uh, in family medicine and a distinguished fellow in the field of addiction medicine. She has experience treating addiction in both inpatient and outpatient settings. Um, to, to touch on the family side of things, Pam Lanhart, Lanhart from Thrive Family Resources is here. Pam is the founder and executive director of Th Thrive Family Recovery. It's a nonprofit that helps families nationally connect to resources, education, and support. Pam is also a certified family recovery coach, peer recovery specialist, uh, invitation to change and craft practitioner, and arise interventionist. She is also a fierce advocate for the human treatment of those suffering from substance use, the ability of harm reduction, and the destigmatizing of those suffering from the disease of addiction. We are also thrilled to have from our, uh, our state house, uh, Representative Dave Baker. Uh, he is with the Minnesota House, where he is serving his fourth term. Representative Baker serves on the Behavioral Health Policy Committee and the Workforce and Business Development Committee, and was elected as an assistant minority leader for the House GOP members. Uh, in honor of his late son, Dan, who passed away in 2011 from an accidental overdose, he has worked tirelessly to bring national leading opioid abuse prevention legislation to Minnesota. 
working across the aisle and with the Senate to bring real change to this epidemic. He serves as chair of the Opioid Epidemic Response Council. Also here is Representative Luke Frederick. Uh, Representative Frederick is a current state legislator in the Minnesota House of Representatives. He has also worked for DHS at the Security Hospital in St. Peter for the last 17 years. His priorities in the House this year focus on SUD treatment, water infrastructure, funding children's museums, and making jury selection trauma-informed. So thank you all again to the panel for being here. We're absolutely thrilled and excited. So as I mentioned, this, this is about solutions and conversations and support. And so um, I'm really thrilled to have Ryan Hansen here, who spent um, the past week with some of New Way's clients speaking with them. So I'd like to introduce Ryan, and then he's going to speak a little bit about um, his experience, and then i um, going to kind of guide some conversations and questions. And as I mentioned, there'll be time definitely at the end for questions. So I'm thrilled to have Ryan. He's a prominent advocate, speaker, author, and media commentator. Uh, he travels from coast to coast to add solutions to our national addiction crisis. He's in recovery from a decade-long opioid addiction, and he has become a leading uh, uh, advocacy uh, for uh, face and voice of recovery advocacy and is really changing the national conversation about addiction. He has content that reaches millions each month and Ryan breaks down cultural barriers that have kept people suffering in silence and is inspiring a new generation of people recovering out loud through his voices project. Uh, Ryan has received praise from Democrats and Republicans alike for addressing addiction as a trans political issue, crossing the political spectrum to build an inclusive coalition focused on solutions. He worked closely with the White House, Senate Democrats and Republicans and US House leadership helping craft portions of the historic HR6 Support for Patients and Communities Act, signed into law in 2018. In 2019, Ryan was named by Facebook as an inaugural leadership fellow and created the National Recovery, uh, National Advocacy Initiative, Mobilize Recovery. And since its inception, Mobilize Recovery has recruited and trained over 4,300 advocates from all 50 states focused on community-based solutions to end the addiction crisis. So Ryan, we're thrilled to have you here. Again, thank you to the panel for being here and thank you all for being here as well. Thank you, Jake. It's great to be here. Uh, great to be with New Way the last couple of days. Um, you know, I, I, I wanna share a short story in a second, but you know, burnout in our field, I think is real. I think anybody up here who does this work you know, continuously can can attest to that. And uh, for me, um, being able to get out here and spend a couple of days with folks who are in early recovery uh, and and folks who are just see the light, you know, in their eyes has just been so refreshing to me. Um, so I'm I'm profoundly grateful uh, to New Way for not just pulling this panel together, but you know, really giving me some time uh, over the last three days to remind me, you know, of my why. And, and, and why we do this work every single day. Um, I uh, had something completely different that I was gonna open this panel with uh, prepared yesterday. And um, something happened to me in, in, in Minneapolis uh, last night that just fascinated me. And it really gave me a tremendous amount of hope. And I think that that's what we're here to talk about uh, is hope, it is about innovation. It is about what members of the community are doing because these are the folks you know that I believe and I'm so grateful that we have two members of the, the legislature here uh, should be listening to uh, because folks uh, like us and, and and you know me on on the advocacy front lines uh, we have had uh, a, a lot of barriers over the last couple of years to get you know people in positions of power and decision makers uh, to listen, uh, not just to the you know recovery community and the harm reduction community and the drug user community, you know, but also providers, uh, harm reductionists, peer recovery support specialists, recovery community organizations, you know, the folks who are providing treatment like New Way does, and um, I, I, you know, I told Jake we had finished up our last session at, at New Way last night, and I was in a rush because I had to get my hair cut. Um, I, I, my, my fiance is, is back at home and my mom is, is, uh, visiting and he's taking care of her and we're going to take a drive up to Utah, uh, to, to go see a, a Broadway show on, on Saturday, which is like one of my favorite self-care things to do. And, uh, my hair hasn't uh, been cut in some time. So I had to find a place to get a haircut and I, I found a Floyd's, uh, right in downtown Minneapolis. 
and um, I was exhausted and got to the Floyds and checked in and, you know, the lady sat me down and, you know, started asking, hey, are you from town, you know, making small talk like, like barbers do. And uh, I, I said, no, I'm, you know, I'm from Las Vegas and, you know, told her a little bit, bit what I was doing. Uh, and then in rushes in like this, I don't know, he must have been 17 year, or 18 year old uh, young gentleman sat down in the barber chair right next to me. And um, the, the gentleman who was cutting his hair struck up the same type of conversation with him. Like, Hey, what are you doing? Like, why, why are you here? And he was so excited. He mentioned, I'm going to Las Vegas for the weekend. <laughs> and I thought, you know, my, my, you know, there was a part of me that was like, well, I'm not going to strike up a conversation with him. That's super awkward, but I am going to listen to what he has to say because I'm here in Minnesota and he's going to Vegas. So what's the deal? And uh, the barber said, well, what are you doing down there? He says, well, I'm going to EDC, you know, which is the uh, Electric Daisy Carnival. It's one of the biggest music festivals in the world. And it happens in Las Vegas this weekend. And um, he said, I'm going down there with my girlfriend. And the barber immediately said, that's great. I hope you have fun. Are you going to be checking your drugs? And I thought, what? <laughs> Did that barber just ask him if he's going to be testing his drugs? And the kid said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I plan on it. I'm going to be checking. I'm going to be testing my drugs. And then the barber said to him, do you have testing strips? And do you have Narcan? And he said, I don't. He says, well, wait a second. I have them right here. Mm. Get and, and, he, and he gave it to him. And I got, you know, I finished, I finished getting my hair cut and, and got in the Uber and I just cried. Um, because that's, that's what's possible. You know, those are the types of things we need to be doing. That's what we need to do to, we need to normalize these conversations just like that, because it's through interactions like at a barber shop or a school or a library or at a restaurant, you know, um, where we can have impact. And um, I, I have not, I, I travel a lot. I have never seen anything like that before, you know, so bravo to, you know, the, the city of Minneapolis and whatever you're doing here is, is really special. Um, we have a, a really great panel here today. Um, as I said, you know, these are the change makers and there's a lot for folks to learn from them, you know, and I want to want to kick this panel off uh, with a few questions for for Justin uh, about a topic that is really close to my heart, which is recovery community organizations. I believe these are underutilized uh, 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 underutilized infrastructures. Uh, across the U.S. that could really uh, help curb overdoses, but also uh, help uh, close that treatment gap disparity that we've had for so long, which, you know, has remained stagnant, stagnant at 90 percent, right around 90 percent. So, uh, Justin, can you help share, like, what is the difference between an RCO, a recovery community organization, and a treatment facility or a treatment program? Oh, all right. Yeah, it's working. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so there's a big difference there. Um, I think oftentimes, you know, treatment centers are where people initiate recovery, but where people really step into long-term recovery and figure out their lives is outside of treatment. And that's really one of the big things that recovery community organizations do is introducing people to the recovery community and working within all the systems. So we don't just work with people coming out of treatment, we can work with people who maybe want to take a harm reduction pathway. Maybe they don't want to go to treatment. Maybe they're still in the treatment process. Um, and it helps guide people and connect people to resources beyond just um, recovery resources. Maybe they need jobs, maybe they need employment. Maybe they need to figure out how to go back to college. And they can do that by getting connected to a recovery community organization. And also it helps people explore other pathways out there besides just 12 step meeting. What if someone doesn't like 12 step meeting? Well, they can go to an RCO and get connected to a variety of different things that are gonna help them. And so really it's not just tied to one thing. You know, A lot of the work I do too is working within different justice involved settings and helping people get a second chance at life who have been incarcerated most of their lives. You know, It's just really cool to see um, 
I started as a volunteer at one and now I'm a staff member just because like you were saying, Ryan, I'm just so passionate about the ability of the scope of my work. Mm. I don't just do one thing. I can help people in a variety of ways. So I've got a follow-up for that. I actually have two follow-ups. One, one that might be a, I, I, but I have to ask this question. What are the barriers for recovery community organizations right now? Like why, you know, given, given their success uh, and, and, and what they're able to do and how different they are from, from treatment, like why don't we have an RCO in every single town, you know, big or small across the state of uh, Minnesota and across the country? Well, I think specifically with Minnesota, you may find this funny. Uh, they call it the land of 10,000 lakes, but it's really the land of 10,000 treatments. Right. And uh, oftentimes, um, that's where a lot of the funding goes. So funding can be a big issue for RCOs. Um, I also think it's getting people to understand they're there and create partnerships. And a lot of times that's not happening either. Um, that people don't understand what they are. Um, it's gotten a lot better in the last few years. You know, Minnesota has uh, over 16 now. But I just think that it's getting the general public to know about them, to understand that like this can be a great handoff for people when they get out of treatment. And it's amazing to see because MRC is one of the, is the first recovery community organization in Minnesota. How many people know about us? But on the other hand, how many people when they hear about us are like, my God, I didn't even know these places mm -hmm. existed. So I think a lot of it is also just public knowledge too. Yeah. You know, and, and, for folks wondering just about, you know, the, the, the stats behind this, um, we know, and, and this was published back in 2016 as a part of the United States Surgeon General's first ever report on alcohol health, alcohol health and drugs. Um, when someone can get past five years of sustained recovery, they have an 85% chance at maintaining that recovery for the rest of their life. When someone can get past year one, they have, you know, a 50% chance of maintaining uh, that recovery for the rest of their life. So uh, one last kind of follow-up question there. Talk a little bit about peer recovery support services, right? Like why, what, what's different between a peer recovery support specialist and let's say a, a treatment counselor and why is peer support, uh, you know, certified peer support so important uh, for sustained recovery journey? Well, I would say that, you know, the biggest difference is that we're not clinical and that it's someone in recovery that can disclose that to you, that has been successful in their recovery, that acts as a guide and a mentor and a resource connector and a support that um, oftentimes people don't have. And I know personally being in recovery, when someone discloses to me that they're in recovery, I'm more likely to open up to them. Like I do that with my justice involved programs. I'll work with people that are refusing to talk to anyone. And you give me five minutes with someone and I say, Hey, I'm a person that's been in jail. And I'm also a person that's found my recovery. They open up like that. And I think it can work hand in hand with counselors. It's, you know, a guide and it's can, they can really fit into any setting. And I have just seen so many people's lives change because, you know, RCOs are based off of peer recovery support. Everything they do is around peer recovery support. And it's just, I think the key factor for a lot of people where they can have success and that their recovery can grow. Thank you. And now uh, to Dr. Brunner, who I'm really excited to actually get to meet in person. I feel like we've been Twitter friends for some time and now it's, you know, to put a, a face to a handle, right? It, it's great. Um, something else that's really important to me. I mean, medication for opioid use disorder saved my life, right? I mean, every, every session we've done here at New Way, uh, I wouldn't be alive today if I wasn't given access uh, to buprenorphine, to Suboxone, uh, medications that I was denied in five previous, six previous treatment facilities in the 2000s. You know, talk a little bit, tell us, you know, how effective uh, are these meds in the population that, that you treat? What are the outcomes you're seeing? Um, the medication is incredibly effective. So if our goal is to keep people alive, which in medicine is generally our goal, um, it, it reduces the risk being on buprenorphine or methadone reduces the risk of death by 50 to 75%. 
there are very few things in medicine that are as effective as treatment with an opioid agonist. Um, I see patients just transform and blossom. I have, I, I feel like it's been the most amazing, cool job. And I always love to try to pull my primary care colleagues, I'm family medicine originally into doing this sort of work because it's such a amazing thing to watch. And you do very little as a physician, but, but get the chance to watch people really get a lot better. Um, there's also reduction in uh, infectious diseases, uh, going into jail, things like that. I always also like to bring up methadone and to talk about just how historically there's been sort of a racial injustice perpetrated. It, it, there's studies that show that it was a 20, white patients were 25 times more likely to be offered buprenorphine than black patients. So I think it's important to just be aware of that. And remember, I think sometimes there can be some judgment. I'm sure not by anyone in this room, um, but it creeps in there with people. And it's really important to know that historic figure. Great. Thank you. And you know, from your perspective, from the medical perspective, what are some of the greatest barriers and challenges, you know, to helping people with SUD that we currently face? Uh, to me, I think this answer has changed over the last five years. I think five years ago, I would have said stigma. I think that actually has improved a lot. I would say now it's funding. I think, unfortunately, despite the fact that, uh, somewhat something like half the amount of years of life lost as coronavirus have been lost with the opioid use disorder. I mean, just take a moment to think of that. 50% of the years of life lost as with coronavirus have been lost to the opioid use disorder. And yet is the funding 50% of what has been spent on coronavirus? It's not even close. Um, and I think that the lack of sustainable funding, the lack of uh, uh, health systems being able to, or willing to support and treat this population has really created holes. I know right at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, unfortunately, there were a couple closures of detoxes at big hospitals, which created big problems that sort of rippled throughout the system. And I think that it's really important for all of us to be a voice. There has been a requirement for addiction and mental health parity since like over a decade ago, but that's just not the reality on the ground. And so uh, reminding patients that they deserve that equal care is, is all of our jobs because it's absolutely as critical as cancer treatment. You would never take a patient with a heart attack, reverse them with aspirin and say, Here's a catheter lab phone number. Why don't you give them a call tomorrow? Like, let's just send you out to the street. But that's currently our standard of care in treating this disease. So helping with that, I think, funding, I think, would be huge. I want to remind everyone who's Zooming in uh, and joining us online that they can ask questions. You can start asking your questions now. Just put them into the chat. Um, and, and we will get to those uh, shortly, but don't wait till the end uh, to ask your questions. Uh, go ahead and start uh, putting them in the chat box right now. And I wanna follow up uh, from what Dr. Brunner just, just mentioned uh, regarding COVID funding and funding for alcohol and substance use disorder, uh, not to take away from COVID one bit, real public health crisis. I had COVID, I know someone who died of COVID, uh, I have a, a mother who has cancer, who is very fragile and we're very careful with uh, specific to COVID, but as someone who's also involved in this space as everyone else, when I saw the numbers and the federal response and the state response uh, to the other declared public health crisis in this country, which is COVID because we have two. And I think oftentimes people forget that overdose and we also have COVID. Those are the two public health uh, declared crises in the United States, yet the difference is uh, funding, resources, and really a sense of urgency. Um, I, anybody can take a guess. Do you know how much more has been spent to combat, combat COVID than, than overdose? And uh, Representative Baker is excluded from this question because we talked about it this morning. 
four trillion dollars. <laughs> Nine hundred times the amount of money. Nine hundred times the amount of money Congress has allocated towards combating COVID. And we, if we really think about it, you know, we marshaled every single resource at our fingertips, and rightly so, uh, states, counties, municipalities, federal government. Uh, to, to get to a solution really quick. We had a vaccine within a year. We had uh, hospital systems being funded. We had pop-up clinics. I mean, it, 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 you know, we had broad mass education. One of the things that really kind of irks me sometimes is I think it, you know, once we hit death, death tolls of you know, 50, 60,000 people, we were having daily White House briefings. You know, governors were having daily White House briefings. They were televised on national TV, right? Um, yet we hit 106,000 American lives last year to overdose with a number that just continues to climb. Um, and it's crickets, or it feels like it's crickets. Uh, and that's maddening. Uh, I, I now uh, want to pass this over to my dear friend uh, who's here today, Pam Lanhart. Pam, uh, it is so good to see you and give you a hug today. Um, you know, I, there's a couple of questions, but I'd love for you to share, you know, within the, the answer a little bit about yourself and also, you know, your motivation to do this work. Um, and, and, and tell us, you know, the, it's estimated, I think a half a million people in Minnesota right now have an active, uh, addiction substance use disorder. But if we assume that for, for every one person using substances, there's at least two others who are impacted. Do you think that the state and the federal government is doing enough to support the family members who are impacted, right? And, 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 and if so, or if not, why? Okay, that's a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> Rhetorical, right? No, no, no. Um, so just real quick, I don't wanna get deeply into my story, but I started the nonprofit about seven years ago because we recognized that families were not getting help. Um, they were told to uh, cut their person off, to do tough love, to detach, to let go. And we know based on the social determinants of health that families are the greatest influencer for health uh, attitudes and those determinants. And so, you know, we noticed that in families that um, aren't getting help, that the behaviors continue. And so we have a 10 year average for people that are using substances before they be, get into remission of the disease. And we know that when families are part of that process, that can go down by almost a quarter. So, you know, rather than 10 years of use, it might be two years of use or three years of use. Rather than 24 treatment experiences, it might be three or five treatment experiences. And yet, you know, what we see in the state of Minnesota is that there are only two, well, really three privately funded treatment programs in the state. All the rest get 240G funding, right? They're state funded and there is no reimbursement for family work in a treatment center. They get four, four appointments with the therapist. And if they wanna bring their family in, then one of those appointments gets taken with that family work. There's no psychosocial education for families, but that's the treatment experience. That doesn't even include the continuum of care and what happens when they experience first use all the way to the remission of the disease. So, you know, thinking in terms of our own family, my parents had substance use disorder. I have siblings that are both in active use and in recovery. And then we have a son who we lost in October. Um, after 12 years, 12 years, he was 13 years old when he started using. And, you know, I think about, I'm gonna take a drink. Um, I think about, you know, if he would have had a peer specialist assigned to him the first time he went through treatment, uh, maybe it would have mitigated that when he was in juvenile drug court, if he would have had a peer specialist working with him, maybe he wouldn't have relapsed after that, you know, um, 12 treatment experience. What's wrong with our society that we can't do better for these families. And then the fact that families are shut out of that process and told just to go to a meeting. Can you imagine like someone presents with substance use and all they're told is just go to a meeting. That's your only help that's available. We don't treat any other disease and we don't treat families with any other disease. Like we do families that are presented 
with substance use disorder. And so we just, you know, when we talk about underserved populations, and I'm, I know there are plenty of them, but I think the family is the most underserved population that's out there when you think about all the numbers of people that are impacted by substance use. So I started this organization to help that. And I'll just give you an example of how it can help. And that is that, um, and it happened to be two kids that went to school with Jake. And the only, right now, the only money I have um, <laughs> it comes out of my pocket. And, um, you know, I do everything via social media and I show up at marketing events and I get the word out. And, um, you know, I had two parents call me the same day. They were classmates of my son. They were in college and they both were in withdrawal from opiate use disorder. And they had absolutely nowhere to go. It was a Saturday. They didn't know what to do. So, you know, thankfully I navigate the system really well. And I was able to get information from them. And by the end of the day, um, and one of them had gone to Fairview and got a withdrawal management protocol, which was really helpful. But by the end of the day, they were both in treatment. They were both in treatment. And, you know, I don't say that to boast. I say that because when because they knew that I did the work that I did, they were able to make a phone call and get the help that they needed to get. And then the beauty that, of the work that I get to do is then I get to destigmatize that, right? Your person is not bad, they're ill. You know, they're not doing this intentionally. They're not doing it to you. And then we start equipping them with, um, in our organization, we use practices that are evidence-based, community reinforcement and family training and invitational um, approaches. Because the truth is families have been conditioned for 80 years that they should wage a war on drugs. And they do. When their person is presented with substance use, they wage a war because that's what they've been conditioned to do. And so we try to take them out of that place of warring with their person into a place of meeting them where they're at and an invitation to change. So. Thank you. And um, a, a second question for you, you know, I've met so many families uh, around the country who are some of the best advocates, right, for, for, for us, for people with substance use disorder, for change. Um, they have very loud voices and they're very effective at it. You know, how, how do families take that step and get involved in advocacy? Um, well, the first thing we want to, first of all, I and while I now am a mother of loss, my whole uh, advocacy is around family recovery and recovering your family. And so for me, that's where we continue to do the advocacy is how can we help families recover? How can they recover together? But the best thing you can do is find out, you know, there's more that happens in the state that you can impact than happens federally. And when you go into that ER, right, and you walk in and that ER doctor treats your person like they have um, leprosy, you need to call somebody and talk to them about that. You find out who your state rep is, you find out who your state senator is, and you get information and you tell your story, right? And we want to tell the stories before somebody dies. Like, I hate that, you know, this is the end of our story. But the truth is that more, you know, we want to tell these stories of life and recovery. But, you know, what's happening when you are trying to call somebody and you can't, get information or you can't get help. One of the biggest things recently is um, I had a friend that lost her son. He walked out of jail, not on medications for opiate use disorder, completely detoxed. And within 24 hours, he was dead. And the, the risk of death from uh, people coming out of jail, I think it's 80% or yeah. something of overdose. I don't have the exact number and I'm sorry I don't, but you know, those are the kind of things that families can advocate for. Like, what are you doing? What are they doing in the local jails? Are there treatment programs being offered? Are they getting Suboxone in the jails so that when they walk out, they don't die? And these are really important ways that families can advocate because they have the story. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move over to, to Representative Baker, and I think I'm going to have the same questions, I think, for both of you, if that's okay, because they're specific to your role uh, as members of the state legislature. 
Um, and I'll start with, with Representative Baker. Um, how, how do we make sure people don't get left behind in this opioid settlement? Uh, dollars. How do we make sure that we're we're filling? No, but I but I'm, I'm just gonna put it put put the cards on the table with you there because like there's so many folks that do great work like Pam's organization and uh, all the other organizations that are up here. Like how do we make sure that we're funding new innovations and you know new solutions uh, rather than just kind of the same systems and uh, whatnot that we've been funding for decades now. Okay, that's a tough one. <laughs> so um, I would say number one, don't count on your government for all the answers. Yes. Because the RCOs, the treatment centers, moms and dads, like us sitting up here and you out there, we know how to try to reach out and help people. We've got the stigma thing, I think figured out, but we are like such a small percentage of the people out there that kind of got it the hard way. So, there's never enough money to fix this. And I think we all know that there is loads of money coming to all states with lawsuits to, from the horrible people that got a lot of us uh, and, and our communities, you know, hooked on something that we would have never have seen. And we, we are starting to talk differently about addiction today than we've ever done before. We're starting to use better language. You know, I am a, a Ryan Hampton junkie on his books right now because they're so good. And I say that because I'm really so excited to listen to you over and over again uh, and what you're doing. Um, and I think part of it is we just have to make sure that, uh, you know, Luke and I, we're, we're teamed up and there's a bunch of us like this that are doing this. So when you start putting folks in public policy positions like Luke and I are, make sure you ask them the question, where are you at? Use the wording that Ryan uses in his book. Are you pro-recovery? Are you pro-life, pro-choice, whatever? Are, are you pro-recovery? Let's see what, see what their eyes do, see what they do. What was that? Well, then take that chance to teach them. You know, a lot of us didn't know anything about this until our family members were sick. So what we have to do is make sure that those people that are in that position to make those kind of decisions are, are, are getting it, at least understand it. Uh, but again, it's gonna take us time to get us there, but the resources are coming, but it's still gonna be slow. We have a very clunky system with, you know, the Department of Health, DHS, Department of Corrections, we have so many things to work through and so many layers of policy that we try to desperately unpeel. And Luke had a, has a great bill this year that he's been working on. And, and we've been working on this um, for, for a long time. And, 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 and again, uh, there is just so much work to do. I can't name the number of moms and dads that have come to me that have said, I just lost a child. What can I do to help? I don't know exactly where to put them either because I need them, but I also trying to run the ORAC organization and, and the, the opioid council, uh, you know, and still be a legislator and run a business at home. It's getting to be a challenge. So we're trying to remember that we are part-time legislators, but we are, we are very focused, a number of us are, to do some good things here in Minnesota. And Minnesota is doing a lot of good things nationally. So, um, there's there's a lot of stuff, but I think we have to really get organized. And again, my mission has been through ORAC is to let us be that 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 board that listens better than anyone. I'm talking to Colleen, for example, and others to bring moms in and dads in of lost children. How can we have a voice on your committee to talk to our council about what should we do? And I want people in 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 real recovery right now to tell us how we can do this because we only have 19 seats. And they're great seats, great people, but we also need a lot more people. We need that 19 times 10 on each one. So we have a lot of work to do. And I know that Luke and I are going to work together on a lot of things with a lot of our other members. So, um, you know, that's just the beginning, but there is going to be a lot to do here. I guess I'll ask Luke, Rep uh, Representative Frederick. Um, I mean, you're both sitting next to each other, which is fascinating and great. Um, what, <laughs> what, what is the importance of and I'll preface it with another uh, term, common sense bipartisan appeal on this issue. You know, what's the importance that we work together across party lines uh, on this specific issue? And what's been your experience with that in the legislature? That is uh, uh, an interesting question. Yeah. Um, I will say this, I'm gonna focus on behavioral health committee because that's how Dave and I met. Uh, that's 
committee is the only committee, I believe, uh, in the Minnesota legislature for the last two years where every single vote that we have taken has been bipartisan. Every vote, unanimous, almost, I think almost unanimous, every single vote. Uh, and I'm really proud to say that I serve on that committee with Dave uh, because it's something that we have been able to focus on finding that common ground, recognizing the issues that are out there and a lot of the work in the SUD world, but mental health and everything else. And um, when I got approached to carry a piece of legislation this year that was focused on uh, SUD work, my approach to that is pretty simple, is I make the assumption that I'm not the smartest person in the room. Uh, and so when I think of who I want to reach out to and who I want to hear from, uh, Representative Baker is absolutely one of those people uh, that I was the first people, first person that I reached out to. Um, another colleague, uh, Representative Frankie, was another person that I reached out to. Uh, and the three of us working with the chair of com uh, the committee, Representative Peter Fisher, uh, was two Democrats and two Republicans all working together saying, we need to get this done. Uh, and it was, it was, working then with partners um, from as, as everywhere that we could uh, to get the language across the finish line. And when it comes to how do we get focus and what do we hear from, I wanna, you know, uh, re what Representative Baker had said too, that, you know, we in government don't have all of the answers, which uh, I'm grateful that I have people in my com uh, community like um, Brandy who will text me and say, hey, just so you know, this is important. Oh yeah, let me follow up quick. Uh, you know, and I run to the people that might be working on the specific issue and um, and that way it brings it to my attention too, because again, all of the aspects, uh, even in just the SUD world, I'm not an expert at, I mean, I've worked in DHS for 17 years, I've worked in adult mental health, uh, the majority of that time, I can talk about the civil commitment status. Uh, and the process of how people get committed and all of that stuff. But in the SUD world, um, I know some of it, but I'm not the expert, but I know that how important it is. Uh, and so I was honored to be able to work on, the, on, on it and, and partner up and try to get it done. Uh, there's aspects of the bill that we worked on that is about those supports. And uh, when I was talking with Amy, um, and she starts showing me the information about how many times people end up going back to treatment and, and how the goal of this legislation is to say, hey, instead of, you know, 10, 20, 50, however many times we want to, you know, once, maybe, I mean, that's the goal, right? Uh, and then we can really do this by putting supports in place, whether it's housing supports, transportation, childcare. Uh, there, I mean, there's other boring stuff in there like rates and, and the other stuff that, you know, is important as well. Uh, but it was this, it was the, those wraparound supports that I think got me hooked into it, uh, that I, it was just easy for me to see the value in that and want to be the champion for it. And uh, again, it was a lot of meetings in committee, a meetings outside of committee to try to figure out and work on language that again, uh, that it wasn't just me, it was like, all of us working together to try to find this language because we all recognized it was important. So uh, in that aspect, uh, it is my first term in the legislature, but I would say that this committee and the work in the SUD world uh, has been one that has been incredibly rewarding for me and has been able to, uh, I, I've been pretty proud to be able to say that it has been bipartisan. Uh, you know, everyone who looks at politics from the outside, you can say, you can see people how they want to bang their head against a wall at times. Uh, and there are those moments, you know, and I can certainly say, Dave and I, there's going to be lots of issues we probably don't agree on too. But because of our experience working on this, we at least can, you know, wander over to each other and say, hey, how's it going? How's your weekend? Uh, you know, and that I think is good for Minnesota because you have people that are working together across the aisle uh, and whether it is SUD or it's other things. So that would seem like long winded. Thank you. You know, one of the things I, and I don't want to turn this into a, a wonky policy. Whenever you get me up with state legislators, I could talk forever because I could just go on and on about policy. But, um, you know, one of the things I do want to say, and it's not specific to here in Minnesota, but I've been saying to other governors and attorneys general uh, around the country is there has been a, you know, some celebration uh, or, or the need to, for some politicians to celebrate the, you know, extraordinary amount of money that is coming from these opioid uh, litigation settlements. Um, and I am of the thought that it's really nothing to celebrate or do a victory lap around because it is 
uh, you know, a small percentage of a very small fraction of what is actually needed um, to tackle this crisis at scale. There's experts, and I'll just speak on the national level that says we need, you know, closer to 20 to $30 billion per year nationally, like the money that Minnesota is, is, is due to receive, you know, spread out over 18 years is what you need actually probably in eight months, you know, to really take this on at the pace uh, that we need to. So I encourage and thank you both for your work, but encourage all members of the state legislatures, Republican and Democrat, to find revenue streams uh, that can get us to scale where we need to be uh, because it's needed now. Um, I uh, want to uh, pass this over to Yusuf. Yusuf, um, you know, um, you work in the industry. Uh, we've talked a little bit about stigma today, uh, which which still does exist and still is a, a huge barrier for us to overcome. Uh, how do we do that? Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Thank you, New Way, for putting this together. Um, just to crack a little joke, I haven't been to the barber for a while. Um, uh, I, used to, I used to have a lot of hair before I started working in the treatment. Um, I can save a lot of money by not getting haircuts, which is good for me. Um, but I think the most important thing is like, you know, um, I think education is very important, like education, 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 especially for the population that I work with, but specifically the East African community. Um, there's a lot of issues with stigma. I, th I think, I feel like the American culture, the Western culture is a little bit ahead of us. For us, like addiction is something that's new. It's been there, but it's something that's new to us. Unfortunately, we have lost a lot of young people, young, a lot of young men and women that are you know, especially with the opiate crisis, we lost a lot of young people, but I think people just don't understand what addiction is. And I think it's very important for us to educate folks about these issues. You know, if someone is diabetic and needs an insulin, you will send them to the doctor, you will give them an insulin. Uh, you wouldn't just kick them out or send them back. And I think that's a big challenge for us. We've even had people that have lost, in our com we lost people in our community and we see a 19 year old or 20 year old overdose. And a mom is saying that my boy died because of a heart attack because she doesn't want other people to find out of what happened. And I mean, living with that is just so challenging. So one of the things that we have done at Alliance Wellness in the last couple of years, we've focused a lot of just educating people. Like what is naloxone? How do you carry one? Um, how do you give someone naloxone? You know, uh, having uh, fentanyl testing strips, giving that to the East African community and, and so forth. So the more we educate folks, I think the more people will get help and hopefully save a lot of lives. And recovery is possible, right? And, and so we talked a lot about peer support. Um, and we have young men that have graduated from our program that are sober, that are staying sober. And it's kind of having those young men speak at the conferences and speak with the community members, going to the mosque, talking to people. And therefore it shows people that recovery is possible and there's hope. And, and that's what we try to do at Alliance. And you know, how does your agency work with and, and meet and serve underserved populations in the in this region? Um, that's a very good question. Um, you know, we try our best. It's definitely not easy. Um, there's a lot of issues, obviously, like, you know, language barriers, um, not having enough counselors. In the state of Minnesota, I think we have over maybe 70 or 100,000 East Africans, and we probably have four or five LADCs mm -hmm. in the state of Minnesota. I'm one of them, right? And we have probably maybe five or six, seven mental health practitioners that are licensed as the independent clinical social workers. So every young person that I see, you wanna go to school, you wanna be at IDC? Uh, <laughs> and so one of the things that we try to do is reflect on the people that we serve. So having people that look like them, that speak the language, you know, um, being culture specific, you know, having the right um, foods, the right, you know, spirituality is a big thing in our community. So having a spiritual, um, and having someone do, who understands addiction as well. You don't want to bring, you know, oftentimes when you talk about religion and, and, and spirituality in our community, there's a lot of like black or white thinking. You know, someone is crazy or they're not. Someone has an addiction or they don't, right? So kind of having someone in the middle who's a mosque from the mosque that understand these issues and educating them about these issues. Um, and so one of the things that we just try to do is have people that, you know, that understand these issues that uh, work in our center so we can help other folks that look like them. So that's what we try to do and sort of bridge the gap and also educate other providers as well. Cause I know that I can't do this work alone. We have a lot of amazing friends in here that we have MRC, Randy, you know, John is here, all these wonderful people that I work with new way. And so educate them so they can better serve my community as well. You know, and that's what we try to do. Excellent. Thank you. And I want to remind folks who are watching 
Uh, please submit your questions. We're getting close to the time to, to take your questions shortly. Uh, go ahead and just put them in the chat. Amy, I'm going to check with you. Are folks putting their questions in? Okay, excellent. Just want to make sure everybody's taking their assignment seriously. Um, I, Brandy, um, some great questions I get really excited about also. Tell us what's recovery capital? I mean, I, I was talking about it all week here at, at, at uh, New Way. Tell our audience about recovery capital and why it's so important. Sure. So you you might be uh, do a better job than I if you've been working on that all week. So I always get really nervous when I get in front of people. So I'm like, what is recovery capital? <laughs> so uh, recovery capital, you know, to, to put it simply um, for if you're not familiar with the term um, is in relation to resources that are available to an individual to help build and sustain their recovery. Um, so that could look a lot of, of ways and it is not just removing the drug or alcohol. So we're identifying uh, what's going on for this individual, what barriers there are, do they have access to healthcare, do they have access to transportation, do they live in a town that has a recovery support meeting at all when they leave treatment with a recommendation to hit three meetings a week. Um, do they have a cell phone where they can access telehealth services? Um, do they have a family member that supports their recovery? So all of those pieces build up someone's recovery capital to help them build and sustain recovery. Great job. Thank you. Very good description. <laughs> um, you know, we often talk about meeting people where they're at, you know, um, what, what does that look like? What does that mean when we say, well, we need to go meet folks where they're at. Sure. Um, so for me, it means I don't, it doesn't matter where I believe that they should be at. Um, so my goal for someone that I might be working with might look one way. Um, and I have to remember to remove myself out of that equation. Um, so for a harm reduction approach or meeting someone where they're at, um, might be just showing up and holding space and finding out that really there might be a a meal that's needed and a Narcan kit and some training. Um, and although that might not look how I want the end of this conversation to look, but right now I'm gonna meet them where they are. Um, and that includes a wide range, right? So that was just one example, but um, it's a, I don't have an opinion of where they should be. I'm just gonna show up and, and help navigate what the next step is for them. And for our, our legislators who are here, um, where do you think some of these funds should be spent? Where, what are some of the, what are some of the gaps you're seeing? I tell them pretty often. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, it, it's been said and, and I appreciate both of you so much, um, and have, uh, for the last several years and seeing the work that you're doing, um, a lot more is to be done. Um, and it's been echoed, uh, throughout all of tonight. Um, you know, for me, uh, it's, it's, Treatment is well-funded um, and I don't discount that. I am, am someone who uh, benefited greatly um, from being able to access treatment services in the state of Minnesota. Um, what the continuum of care looked like for me was very, very different. And um, so, you know, as, as the founder of a recovery community organization in Southern Minnesota, um, that was something that I needed. It wasn't um, any other reason that that started. So. That includes housing, um, it includes access to transportation, it includes supports uh, that aren't traditional, um, that is uh, Narcan more widely available, uh, you know, in, information uh, that's out there, breaking that stigma. A peer support person in all places is my ultimate goal. Um, and, and that's just so that I no longer feel really uncomfortable um, in a doctor's office or at the dentist um, or feel ashamed to say, I can't actually do that because I will be homeless by next week. <laughs> so um, just, just having the ability to have someone uh, that speaks my language, that knows where I've been um, and I don't feel judged. Um, and for me, that's peer support services in, in all places. Um, but that's a piece of the entire pie that I think has been echoed tonight. Absolutely. Um, Jess, so how does this overdose crisis, how does it change regionally? You know, we see some areas uh, affected more than others. 
you know, what is it that led to uh, that that led uh, into Duluth, uh, a city that's disproportionately affected by these overdose numbers and data? Yeah, um, I apologize. Brandy heard me talk about this for like an hour on Monday because I went down to Mankato. Um, I, I personally really appreciate the three wave model that the CDC uses to kind of like explain the opioid epidemic. Um, if you're not familiar, wave one kind of started in the 90s with prescription opioid rates, like people are getting Oxycontin for tweaking their back. Wave two started in 2010 with the increase in heroin overdoses, wave three around 2013 with fentanyl overdoses. Um, so I look at and think about, you apply that model to your region and think, were you disproportionately affected by any of those waves? And in Duluth, which if you're not familiar, we're up north, the corner of Lake Superior in St. Louis County, um, Duluth uh, was disproportionately affected. Um, Arco's data from 2006 to 2012 found that the city of Duluth had the highest prescription opioid rate in the entire state with a rate of 5,000 grams per 10,000 people. It, it, wild, right? Not as wild as the fact that during that same time frame, five Duluth pharmacies, all, just Walgreens, five Walgreens in the city of Duluth. Keep in mind for every Walgreens, there's a CVS. We also have local pharmacies, grocery stores have pharmacies, Target has a pharmacy. Five Walgreens in the city of Duluth gave out 14.3 million opioid pills. That is almost on par with the six Mayo Clinic pharmacies in Rochester, which gave out 14.4 million pills. Mayo serves hundreds of thousands of people a year. Duluth is a city of 86,000 people. So we were far disproportionately affected by wave one, therefore far disproportionately affected by wave two and wave three. We now Again, we had the highest prescription rate in 2020. We now have one of the highest overdose fatality rates in the state and by far the highest overdose fatality rate in the country for Native Americans. Native Americans in St. Louis County are seven to eight times more likely to die of a heroin overdose than their white counterparts. We're screwed, honestly. And it continues to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And there are people on the ground and people in recovery yelling for the solution. And I, I get worked up because <laughs> I think about this opioid settlement money and how it's not putting a dent in what they did to us and how this money, we, we talk about it where it goes into the counties and it goes into the cities and people so far removed from the problem are making the solution yes. when that money belongs in the hands of the people that it harmed. And to make matters worse in Duluth, and I, I try not to talk about just Duluth specifically, but uh, Duluth is also seeing the same issue that we see nationally, where you think of the beginning of the opioid epidemic and it was happening in poor rural areas. So like Appalachia is the epicenter. Now you're 45% more likely to experience an opioid overdose if you live in an urban area versus rural. So it's, it's switched, it's now in urban areas. Um, in our Arrowhead region, Duluth makes up like 30% of the population. We make up 67% of the fatal overdoses. Um, so in Duluth specifically, when I think about the solution, you look at one, that the substance use response team, the program I work in, 35% of our clients last year were housed. 35% had a place to live that they could call their own. We have a 1% vacancy rate in Duluth. So we have all of these policymakers deci making decisions for us about all of these new things we could do. Look at this new cool program. And this is this new innovative thing. The answer is housing. That's it. It's that simple. Give people a place to live. <laughs> yeah. I, I, we, have to, we have to trade numbers. Yeah, Representative Baker. She's exactly right, Jess. Um, and part of the thing that Minnesota did when it comes to the settlement, does it sound okay? Can you hear this okay? Is, uh, is uh, Minnesota. Here you go. Take it. Take it. <laughs> Politicians yeah. should have known better. <laughs> anyway, but so I can hear the most important thing I said was Jess is right. And I'll tell you what we did in Minnesota here when it came to the lawsuits that we haven't seen a dollar yet. Okay, so it's, it's coming, it's not here yet. And we had to get a landing pad. We had to make sure we changed statutes here to make sure we took it in right. But 75% of what we're getting is going right to the counties. 
because I will tell you it's a lot smoother and a lot quicker to get it to our communities than it is trying to go through DHS. So that was one thing that we at ORAC said. And, in, and when we look at all the states, because I'm seeing all the settlements around the whole country, the percentages of what they broke out, we are one of the highest that we gave to the counties because we trust our county partners. Now that doesn't mean just that we don't have our counties that got to figure it out too. We got to make sure we communicate with our local county commissioners and our public health, but it's closer to you this way than it is if it's sitting here in St. Paul. So understand now our role as ORAC will be 25% comes to us. We're going to make sure we try to collaborate with counties and share the great ideas that are going on out there. That's what our role is going to be, but we've got to get it closer to the people. And that is what we really understood right away. So we are one of the highest to give it to our big cities and our, and our counties. We're all going to get money on this, but it's not enough. But it's, it's something. Just wanted to say that, but thank you, Jess. Thank you. I'm going to do a follow-up on that one, if that's okay. <laughs> I do want to say in other states, I, I also am a, a huge advocate for a fund for victims. Uh, people who have been directly harmed by the overdose crisis, you know, in any other, uh, I guess you could call this a mass tort type case against pharmaceutical, a big bad corporation where actual humans were harmed. The first people who should be receiving a paycheck are the ones who were harmed directly. And that's the family members. That's the people who lost decades of their life. That's the people who lost employment. That's the people who are still out on the streets using drugs. And I think that stigma played a very big role in keeping dollars out of the hands uh, of those individuals. Not something that, you know, individual, I think state legislators can handle unless they, or, or were the cause of, unless they, they dedicate some of this as a fund to them. Um, but it was really upsetting to me. And I think a lot of folks in my community that we individually were completely cut out of the deal because the harm that states claims uh, claim they have they have uh, been victim to in counties and cities are all on the backs of the harm of the individuals first. Um, Jess, I, I have uh, one more question for you about peers. So how how does peer recovery play into your SUD outreach, um, specifically the efforts that are housed in the police department, which is a great place to have peers, and we need more of that. Yeah, and I, I, um, I always give props to the leaders that be at the Duluth Police Department um, because they hired me uh, thanks to them, um, not with the understanding that they were going to make a peer recovery led program. I just happened to be someone in recovery and snaked my way in there, I think. <laughs> um, but then they were able to like kind of hand over the reins of the program to me entirely, which is something that like now working in an SUD program within a police department and I get to see all these models nationally, I go, God damn, I am lucky. Because usually police departments partner with outside agencies to do their peer recovery outreach. We are all housed right within the police department. Um, we have access to all police records. We're able to see everything. We're able to hear calls come over the radio and respond to scenes where SUD is the, the root of the cause of why police are having involvement. Thank you. <laughs> but I think now being inside of this and seeing programs nationally that it's not happening in, I'm like, this is what, this is what needs to happen. And um, Yusuf, you talked about like being able to have somebody in the seat that looks like you and speaks your language. Um, I am grateful that I was able to build a team that represents the community that we do outreach with. And we have a Native American who was investigated by the task force that we work with, um, who they lis listened to me and hired, um, that's able to do outreach and reach Native folks in a way that I would never be able to reach them. Um, and I hope uh, we're expanding the program and hiring another uh, peer recovery specialist. And I hope we can also find another Native person in our community that will, is willing to take the risk to work in a police department because it's a big ask to have folks of color come into a police department and do work like with us. Um, it's crucially important. And the idea, how, how can we have this conversation of police reform without also talking about getting peer recovery specialists into the police departments who want to educate cops? Um, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with cops where I can see the kind of light bulb moment of like, oh, that's what SUD is about. Um, and educating the community on who do we call 911 on and who don't we? 
Um, cause it's, we also have to in police reform, educate the community on how to use police. Cause we're all ignorant of how we use police. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I know we have some questions from the audience, right? Uh, and if there's anyone here who has a question also, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, Jake is gonna moderate it, but before I pass it off to Jake, you know, thank you each and every one of you for the work you do, uh, for welcoming me back into your beautiful state. Uh, I know he's watching, so he probably uh, will kill me if I don't say this, but I married or am marrying a Minnesotan. So by extension, I am a little bit of a Minnesotan. I spent a lot of time in this gorgeous state. He's trying to get me to move here with him someday, so we'll see. Uh, and I wanna say a special thank you uh, to, to both of our members of the legislature, Representative Frederick, Representative Baker. You know, this is a difficult issue to get out ahead of. Thank you for your work on it. You know, we, not, we can't always agree on everything, but there is so much more that we do agree on and what we should be doing. And we have to find pathways forward. And please keep listening to the good folks here, the good folks who are out there. So many of us are impacted uh, and we need you. We need you to continue being our champion. So thank you. Can I dive in real yeah, quick? Um, I actually want to echo something that Pam had talked about earlier. Uh, in committee, some we have a lot of testifiers come in and talk about a, a wide range of issues. And everybody has their own approach to things. And sometimes it feels like we get buried with numbers and statistics and all of this stuff. And I'm, my head starts spinning and I'm all like, I'm lost. Uh, but to Pam's point, stories right? Sharing stories. I, the first time I ever heard this phrase, stories change the world, it, it stuck. And I can't tell you how much that is true in my current job. Having one person or a small group of people come up before us and share their stories is, for me, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but for me is the most impactful thing uh, that I can have. Uh, and whether it's SUD related, we had high school students um, come before us uh, last year talking about they can't consent to mental health services. Uh, and so hearing their stories uh, and, and, and listening to them and even just listening to people here, uh, <clears throat> it's, it really does have an impact. And so when it comes to the other questions that we had uh, previously too about how can family members, how can loved ones get involved, it's, it's sharing your stories uh, because some people think, oh, my story is just one story. It's not significant. They are. Your story, one person's story is powerful. And so if you know someone who has a story, encourage them to share it. That's, a, that's amazing. That's really inspiring. And I think one of the questions, we've got a lot of engagement uh, online. And so there's some really good questions here. But I think we'll start off with, um, this one was to, to both of you representatives. Um, how can I be a voice for pro recovery? And I think you kind of summed it up right there with story. You're exactly right. Uh, Luke said that. Uh, understand and ask those questions about uh, what do they understand about this. You're looking at a couple of future leaders in the house. I'm telling you this because we are we are serious about getting things done when we're there. We're not just trying to fill a seat, and um, we literally go there. And, and and there's there's not all of us think this way, but we actually want to get some things done. But just ask those questions about the pro recovery. Tell your stories and never, ever, ever be ashamed of what you are or what you've gone through and share that story loudly. And I know it's painful for especially people out there that have lost a loved one, but just let's tell about how great our loved one was and still is in our heart. And that's what may, makes a difference in front of the testifying table, because I will guarantee you there's more of us coming every single year that think about this issue. So I've got so many notes here from some amazing people at this head table right here. I've got ORAC ideas coming out of my brain. And, 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 and we've got a lot of things we have to connect with here because you've got the real A team almost here in Minnesota. And there's a lot of you sitting in the audience that have been so plugged into St. Paul already too. You know, just nationally, I see folks here that we really are rocking it. So I don't, you know, I didn't even answer it. But anyway, um, you wanna to add to that? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Can I say one thing? Absolutely. To, to folks who are watching, you can be pro-recovery, sharing your story, being out loud about your recovery, but really to be pro-recovery when it comes to legislators, know where they stand, vote for the good ones, vote out the bad ones. Know where people stand on this issue and make it a voting issue. I guarantee you they will listen to you. Um, 
let's do one in person and then we'll do another one uh, online. So yeah, what's your... So I um, thank you all of you uh, for, I can come to you whenever I can uh, because I learned so much, but uh, my frustration is being a parent who's lost a child and uh, I look around and I'm proud of parents who have and who do have, uh, but until you're in the thick, and, and so until you're in the thick of it with somebody who's dealing with addiction or until you've lost someone, we're the ones that are out there physically suffering. This should be standing room only. It frustrates me. Well, I'm loud, Randy. Okay. Um, okay. um, it frustrates me that there aren't more people out here. And um, it, how do we get this out there? Again, it should be on the news channels. It should be in, you know, um, it, the guy. And thank you guys for what you're doing. But it frustrates me as a parent because, you know, I lost my son almost eight years ago. And Two years before that now i'm dealing with another son because of the death of one son and i'm so frustrated as a parent because you fight and 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 again you know people look at you like well that's that family that's that person no it's not and then and then it's happening to you now and now you're calling me absolutely i'm going to talk to you about this and help you out but how do we get the message out there um sorry i'm kind of frustrated i'm i'm very i'm very heated like you are just um but i guess that's the thing is it should be news bulletins it should be you know uh, at sporting events it should be i remember the steve lemmer hope foundation where we couldn't put anything up about fentanyl because we were at a game you got to be freaking kidding me you know baseball game so i guess what can we do as a parent as a community member to get this front and center I mean, we've done a little bit in the time that I've lost my son. Um, go to school board meetings, go to city council meetings, go to uh, everything locally. We were handing out masks and, and wipes and everything else. Why not Narcan when they walk into a place? You know, if we can get our hands on it and start looking at it like this is just real medicine. What happened at Floyd's Barber? Hey Amen, I'm so glad it happened in Minnesota. <laughs> tell that story. We have to tell that story all the time. So it's about the stigma of these people are, are faced with a disease they do not want, but we have to find ways of making it so that we can actually tell them, you know, if you're gonna experience, make sure it's clean, make sure, make sure, go to, go to where they're at. It's just constantly, and this is, this is enormously um, exhaustive work. And we all know that, but we gotta just keep at it. We gotta keep at it because our loved ones count on us, our, our folks and yet that are in recovery, but also the ones that have yet to even try to, that, that will be in trouble someday. We've gotta make sure that when they get it there, we're gonna help them and we're gonna catch them. But there is nothing easy, but we just can't give up. But we've gotta make sure that it's the stigma about this, about this issue that Ryan does such a great job talking about. But again, it's, it's getting people in our communities that are elected officials from every level, church boards, um, um, county commissioners, school boards, everything. We're trying to get a bill with, in school boards to have schools required to have Narcan in the school buildings. Now, it was unfunded, but we couldn't get it through this year because it needed money and the schools right now are just like, whoa. But it takes you though, going to the school board meetings because then the school board association hears it. Oh yeah, we better have this now. That's what it comes down to, not just legislators. Here's one more mandate. But this is what it takes. We just got to get it all out there so that it's easy to get. But that way we can save people. That's just the back end. That's that's the last resort. We got to get on the front end with prevention and education too. But anyway. So if I may, I thank you so much. And, and doing exactly what you just did is exactly what you need to continue to do in all places. Um, I often go in and talk to school social workers and principals and um, when I approach harm reduction with someone who's not familiar with substance use disorder, I ask them if they wore their seatbelt on the way into work. Mm -hmm. And I ask them if they went the speed limit and I ask them if they use sunscreen because all of those are harm reduction measures. And when you explain it in those ways, they pay attention to what you're saying and start to have a conversation with them. Um, I go in all places and all ways and continue to talk about exactly those things and they will start to hear and see what you're saying. I just wanted to echo the issue, the school board as being a super important place for this to continue to come up. I know, for example, I'm from Washington County and that's a place where actually we have a pretty high morbidity and mortality rate um, and pretty significant lack of access to services. Um, but there is so much stigma about, I'm on a chemical dependence subgroup for my school board and the response to overdose deaths is like, let's not talk about it. You know, at one point, someone from the administration said, this is no longer our 
our student because they're dead, <laughs> that we don't need to talk about it. I, I think that having you know a loud, impactful voice there is so important because uh, you know our kids right now. There's a mental health uh, crisis in children right now, children and adolescents. I think that. Um, they need all the help that we can give them and they don't have Narcan in those schools. And so I, I mean, that should definitely be a bill that goes through. I would love to support that in whatever way I could. And I think so with the whole Minnesota American Society of Addiction Medicine. And thank you for telling your story. That was really touching and I'm sorry for your loss. I wanna add just one quick thing, which is good news on that front, which is that DHS put out an RFP last month for uh, embedded chemical health uh, professionals in every school district. And so this is the first time, and I remember begging <laughs> for help when, my, and we saw the difference between our daughter who had mental health issues and our son who had chemical health issues. And the response to my daughter was, you know, get her help, engage her, pamphlets, brochures, all of those things. And with my son, it was, you get a five-day suspension and you're, you're your parent's problem. And so, you know, they are, uh, and, you know, again, DHS will move slow on this, I'm sure. But the good news is, and we do have to be in those schools and advocate, uh, even if your kids are older now, and just go back and tell your stories, because it is important. Thank you, and thank you for that question. Um, one of the first questions that came in online, and I think anybody on the panel would be uh, fully uh, qualified to answer this. Do you believe there could be successful recovery with strictly peer recovery support and no clinical support at all? Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, I see it all the time at my work, uh, every single day. You know, There's people where that is all they need. And if you got someone that you're working with on their recovery and you're in recovery, I'd say the success rate is really high. I, I do want to add that, you know, it, we have to look at this from a very individual individualized approach, right? Some, it depends on the severity of someone's substance use disorder. There are definitely people like me who yeah. will need treatment, yeah. right? <laughs> there are people who may not need treatment and peer support is completely sufficient. Um, recovery, you know, you hear it oftentimes, it's not a straight line, it's not linear, and, and it's not one size fits all, but the peer recovery aspect of it, certified peers are underutilized, uh, and we just don't have the, the capacity or the money to create the workforce that we need to meet the need. I, I have always thought that if we had, you know, uh, $200 million, let's say, nationally to build a peer recovery workforce, you know, train up a peer recovery workforce, in my opinion, I think we could cut that treatment disparity in half overnight. Any questions in the audience? I'll bring the microphone back here to you. <laughs> One of the things that I would like to suggest to everybody in this room, if you have a, a, an influencer in your school district who you can say, we can, to some degree, we can bypass the people who are keeping us from talking to young people and giving them the tools that they need. Because school board members do not want us educating our kids. School principals are not in favor of it. But if we get to health teachers and we can get into classrooms, I can tell you right now, in the state of Minnesota, probably 75% of kids still think that they will be arrested if they call 911. So we have a great law, Steve's law. People don't know about it. Kids do not have the stigma that adults do. So if we're talking to young people and we let them know that they don't need to be 18 years old to carry Narcan and that they don't need a prescription, I have kids lining up, please, can you help me get it? And not just their friends who are overdosing and dying, but their parents. Mm -hmm. I, I spoke to, we've been in schools throughout the state of Minnesota, and it's frightening to me how hungry young people are to talk about this and how unwilling the adults in the rooms are willing to have those conversations. So as influencers and in advocacy, the people who are never at the table 
are the people, are the young people, which right now they are being impacted at greater and faster rates than any other segment of our population, especially if they're people of color or Native American. So our actions in terms of reaching out to our schools, it changes the way the, the upcoming adults look at addiction. And it's a faster path, I think, to slowing down some of the stigma and getting young people to ask for help. I would, I would, we just have to start doing more of it. One of, one of the things that I've seen in a couple other states, and I was just asked, I was conferring with my fellow Minnesotan friends here if, if it's happening here, but you know, there's a, the, the peer recovery, peer support specialist uh, phenomenon is, is quite effective. And in schools, elementary, middle, high schools, like we should be embedding peers in those schools. Like we should have peers available in those schools. There are some roadblocks with licensing to provide peer support. Just saying. There, there is not. So that, that is a mis misunderstanding. And so I, I, I really just want to make this clear. Uh, statute calls out any minor, and, and I can define minor by statute for you. Um, a minor is any person under the age of 18 can access and ask for uh, any treatment services, including drug and alcohol treatment services in the state of Minnesota, if their parents are on a PMAPS, they are automatically qualified to receive those treatment services under their insurance. If their parents are on a commercial insurance plan, they can go to the county and access the consolidated fund based on their income that day. So adolescents can absolutely on their own access peer support services. It can be covered under a consolidated fund in the state of Minnesota. And, uh, if, if there is probation involved in it, it becomes a requirement of probation is the only time that at that point a parent needs to sign. That is a fact. <laughs> Can I just briefly talk on kids calling on parents overdosing? I just wanna stress like, that I'm so grateful you brought it up and it's definitely not like an anecdotal thing. Like this happens all of the time. I read overdose reports daily. Um, and see it happen very frequently. And I think like if we're talking about like how do we advocate in our communities, one thing that you can do is talk to your local police department and sheriff's department about handle with care models, which will identify kids who are at the scene of drug or violent related incidents. And then it'll give a notification to that child's school to handle with care. It doesn't necessarily disclose what the call was. It's just to let the school know that this child just experienced something very, very traumatic and be sure that you handle with care and make sure that they're accessing the services that they have available at the school. Um, it's proven to be hugely successful. Um, and, and kids are Narcanning their parents and way more than you would think. Um, we'll do another one online and then we have another question here. Um, I know that housing is really important to a lot of the folks on the panel here. And the question is, how do we help make transitional slash sober housing more accessible and safe for our loved one? Do you have suggestions on where we can start in our local communities to get loved ones the much needed safe housing that supports recovery? So, so <laughs> Uh, I, I can tell you uh, it, it's uh, educating the community uh, is step one. Um, so that's not always uh, easy. At, at one point, I, I thought the route was to be real, real loud about what I was trying to do and, and found out that that wasn't it. So um, I, uh, you know, for, for us in Southern Minnesota, um, it was talking to the community and trying to break stigma and um, leaning on local landlords and finding one person that would give me a shot in a five bedroom house. And it was just educating and um, getting community buy-in and um, realizing and without that, without uh, 
a person with lived experience willing to um, give it a shot, you need capital to be able to do it. Um, and if you do, you, you have, you'll have great success in getting uh, recovery residences um, open and available, but you have a city that, you know, if you're in a small town, Minnesota, you're also going to be communicating with, uh, with the city council about what this is going to look like and what harms are going to be in place for the neighbors that are, you know, three blocks away that heard about it. Um, so it's, it's really educating uh, your community and the system and, um, and quite frankly, if you're licensed at, through the Department of Health, the city can't tell you where you can put a recovery residence. <laughs> Is there a question in person here? Hi, I have three children and my oldest one is in high school and my middle child is in middle school. It's not on? It's on. Is it on now? Hi. So I'm listening to all this amazing advice and, and lived experience. And I'm wondering as the mother of three children, um, the oldest two being 16 and 13, does it make any sense for me to get Narcan for them to have on them in case their friends need it or their yes. friends' parents? Yes? Yeah. I, I do Narcan trainings all the time and I tell people everybody should be carrying Narcan, everyone. Okay. So where um, do I go to get it? Where do I find that out in my community? There, the Minnesota just launched this new website. What is it? Knowthedangers.org. Okay. Steve Rumler is the place to go for nar naloxone in Minnesota. I just want to give you a little piece of data that we just heard in Dakota County um, at a forum. And that was in the last four years, um, the uh, drug task force, in all of their seizures, not one of the pills that they seized was a real prescription pill. So when your kids go to a party and there are pills that look like benzodiazepines or pills that look like Oxycontin, they are fentanyl and that they're dying, they're dying. And so, you know, having, um, I have a friend whose son was in a dorm room in Wisconsin and he took a pill that was a fentanyl pill and his dorm mates were Googling what an overdose looked like. And they had no Narcan on the floor. Um, that has changed now, but you know, we, we have to realize that what was going on even, and I, I just said to my good friend, Ben, that if Jake would have been would have been in now using at 15, he would have been dead at 15 because they were using, you know, pills. And 10 years ago, those pills weren't fentanyl. They were benzos, they were Oxycontin. But what they're buying now on Snapchat are fentanyl pills that look like Tylenol, that look like benzodiazepines. They call them bars or footballs. You want to get to know the slang. You want to get to know the terms that they're using, but a hundred percent educating your kids. And, you know, I think there's this, this is part of the job that we do is, you know, this idea that you're condoning the substance use by promoting harm reduction. And as Brandy said, you know, would you put them in a car without a seatbelt or, you know, would you not take them to the dentist for their checkups? I mean, it, it needs to be just as routine because the kids are the ones that are going to be saving the kids or their parents. And um, even, and what we're seeing too, is the elderly population that are overdosing because they forget what pills they're taking. And so really you can go to a super America and you can see somebody overdosing in the bathroom. You, you know, it really should be like, I'm carrying, you know, a pack of gum in my purse. I'm carrying naloxone in my purse. And I wanna encourage you as a parent of young children that talking about this doesn't condone the behaviors. It keeps them safe because kids are curious. They, you know, read, they're being groomed on social media. And so that's where we have the upstream piece of it. There's a lot of communication skills that we help families gain in how they're talking to their kids about this, but listening, creating safe spaces, being curious about what they're talking about in their school, and then making sure that they have access to mental health services initially can help with that prevention piece. You know, there's another question here um, in person. 
Uh, hi there. Thank you so much to all the panelists for sharing. It's been really great. Um, my questions are, maybe it's a question rather, is going to be directed towards the representatives. Um, maybe out of your mouth, but definitely out of other people's mouths. I've heard words like urgency, mental health support. We need to support our young people. Like we, we need to get to them early. Um, directly speaking to you, Representative Frederick, uh, part of, like I heard you, you slipped it in. You were like, we were in a race to finish the language. And what I wondered about is if that was for the budget that, that was kind of framed yesterday or came out in the 11th hour the other night. Um, so my direct question to you is, is you know, both as representatives, uh, and thank you both, uh, uh, Representative Baker, fantastic job on the Oric Council. And um, I truly believe what you said, that I'm looking at the next leaders of the House. Um, but I do want to come directly at you, uh, Representative Fredrickson. I know it's your first year. I know that you guys are both on the Behavioral Health Council. Um, I want to... I want to phrase this in a polite way. If we're talking about urgency, the bill definitely got ripped on the urgency for mental health support. And I want to know how can we gain more legislative support? Because I know that we have community here and we're talking about it, but as policymakers, that's that's really where it's going to trickle down. When we're talking about money and real money, we're talking about government. So I just want to know, like, I know that you both did wonderful work to, to, to like, help find copacetic language for the omnibus bill. But at the end of the day, a lot of the words that I heard today, I don't think got fulfilled. I mean, I really think that like young people got shortchanged this year. And if I'm, I'm a little fuzzy in my head today, but if I remember, I don't even think the, the actual decent mental health support starts until 2023 or later. Correct me if I'm wrong, Representative Baker. So I don't know if there was a question in there, but, <laughs> but please don't take it as an attack. I'm just, no, I'm just worried all. about our young people, you know, and we got, we got ripped. So how do we create more of a um, an inter, like there's a lot of intersectionality here. We're talking about mental health and SUD. So if you're on the Behavioral Health Council, how do we get more support from the Senate to actually fund that stuff using words like urgency and get them early? And I hope that made sense. Uh, there's part of me that, you know, when it comes to the very last point you made, like how do we convince the Senate? I, I, if you can figure that out, please share. Um, you know, and I don't know if my uh, colleague here has any uh, experience and wisdom to share on that one, but I'll, so I'll let him kind of tackle that piece. Um, so in my comments previously to talking about some of the, the language that we were working on on the bill uh, was much earlier in session trying to, as uh, the bill was moving from committee to committee, uh, we actually heard um, the bill about to, uh, I think there was one informational hearing and then two committee hearings in the Behavioral Health Committee. Uh, and the bill did a whole bunch of different things. DHS was weighing in with some concerns that they had. And we were all trying to work together to find the right language so it could keep moving forward. Um, one of the, um, to try to tackle like the, you had a lot of different pieces that you were hitting there. So I'm gonna try the best I can to try to like give you the best answer. And so if you want to follow up with something more specific, please do. I tried to keep it so concise. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm so sorry. One of the challenges in, the, in this job is working in behavioral health, right? We're hearing a lot of stuff uh, in the SUD front and what can we do? What can we make better? Uh, but it doesn't stop there, right? It, it, when it comes to mental health, we're hearing bills on how can we improve mental health access uh, to some of the things the other panelists have said about how uh, not only is there not enough mental health uh, services in the state, there's not enough mental health professionals in the state, right? And so then you have, that's a priority we have to work on. Uh, when it comes to education, 
uh, about mental health. That's another priority when it comes to the general education and funding education in general terms. That's another thing, right? And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And uh, some of the things that we've already been talking about, about advocacy, about how do we make this something that everyone's talking about, that is a million dollar question at times because there are so many voices at times advocating for so many different things. And unfortunately, even though you can have that one person that's screaming and trying to be the loudest in a community, uh, if there's another 50 other people all also screaming, it's like, where do you focus? How do you, how do you like, where is the biggest fire? Well, what I might think is the biggest fire is someone else's, oh, that's not the biggest fire. Uh, and, and it's just trying to, you know, put as much help as possible in the way. I don't know if I have a good answer for you, uh, because I know that if, uh, if Representative Baker and I could work together and we had complete control out of, you know, all the money on human services, I think we could do a pretty good job. I could say it probably would look different than what might be the actual end bill, but we don't have that kind of authority in the legislature where we just get to do whatever we want. Um, even though that sounds like it could be a fun yeah. time. Uh, you know, so it, it, it is one of those things where it is the continued advocacy. It is that when you advocate, it's not the one time and you're done and you walk away. It's you're there and you're there again and you're there the year after that and the year after that. Uh, in the specific piece that I've been working with New Way on, uh, we couldn't get I, a lot of it across the finish line. We're not going to this year. And I'm really frustrated at that um, because not only is it something that I personally just care about, I also invested a lot of my time this year uh, into it. Uh, along with Representative Baker. And so to see that even as, as a legislator, this is something that like my entire year's worth of legislation this year was really focused on the SUD world. Uh, and to see almost none of it get included in the final house bill that we sent to the Senate was crushing. Uh, and that's just me in a work like a daily, you know, day by day basis. That's not even addressing like the real world impacts that I think it would have on people, right? Because it would mean more to someone that we can get this work done because it has a direct impact on their life. Me, it's like, this is what I worked on for a year, but this is stuff that people have been impacting people for a lot more than that. Um, so I don't have a perfect answer for you other than don't stop. And know who your legislators are. I happen to have one of my district, Mitra here, is from my district, happens to be from Wilmer all the way down. And I'm surprised to see you here. Um, but know who they are. And again, but, but Luke's right on. There's so many priorities, so many things. The founders made it challenging to make a law change. And it's so much. People are screaming for some tax relief, folks. We've got way too much money. That's also part of the biggest problem we have. We, get, we did tons of funding last year in schools and behavioral health. There wasn't a school district out there that was not was not was not disappointed in their funding. If you ask them, they weren't. We we did record funding last year, but everybody's back this year because we have so much money. We have an excess here this year in Minnesota, and we're gonna see billions of dollars going out again this year in things because we have the money. But again, to that question, we don't have the right answer because it's slow, clunky. It's government, and I told you earlier, don't 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 count on them for all of the answers. Some of them, yes, we have to change policy, but but know who they are that represent you and try to make them listen to you and listen to us. And we just need more of us there. Good idea. No, I just want to say, Representative Baker, I mean, uh, the, the, just hearing about all the money the state has, I would just say, let's get some of that money into this, you know, like, I mean, cause that's how I, when I talk to legislators, I'm like, I, you know, I'm not just an addict. I'm not just someone in recovery from substance use disorder, you know, who was just harmed by pharmaceutical companies. Like I'm a taxpayer, you know, I pay taxes for these services that we should be getting. I pay a lot of taxes. <laughs> and we spend a lot of money on this. Trust me. I mean, our rule 25 money that goes to the counties, that's from the state folks. We are, we are dumping it, but we're not maybe using it the best way we can. So I get it. I hear it. And again, I lit up the house floor supporting Luke's bill that got chopped all in pieces. I'm a Republican fighting for his bill that his party didn't put in the bill. It pissed me off. And again, just going back to the Senate, the Senate does a lot of really good things too, but right now they're very focused on, on fiscal constraint. This is not a budget year. So just know that 
there's there's a 201 legislators down there representing their district and it's 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 meant to be this way so it's it is clunky but when you're there longer you understand it again we are champions of of a few issues not all of them because we are not experts there but on this issue we're just a couple folks that are screaming really loud and we'll continue to do that on a similar topic, there was a question online um, to both your representatives again. Um, what do you hope to accomplish by the governor's executive order appointing an addiction and recovery director, sub cabinet and advisory council? Any thoughts on that? <laughs> okay, so um, I really appreciate the governor wanting to put some eyes on this alongside of ORAC. Um, I've said this publicly, so this isn't a, this isn't a surprise. I'm just so disappointed that he hasn't talked to me about this ahead of time. What do you think about this? Do you need more support? How can we support you? Um, we, with, with Randy and a lot of help here, we, we passed this bill, House File 400, a couple of years ago with the ORAC Council getting established. Do you know how hard it is to go through legislators to do this? The first in the nation to go after the pharmaceutical companies with this. And I'm very proud of what we're doing. And I'm happy the governor wants to have a sub cabinet director on this. It's more people helping. I just don't know what their idea is yet with this. And, I, and we need to communicate. I don't want to have any more silos. I want the ORAC to be the motherboard of the state to be, to be having the resources. And I know we can't do it all. I know we can't. But I want to understand what that is. I'm just a little confused about what that mission is. I don't know what it is. But I'm happy he's paying attention. But it also happens to be six months before an election. I'm just going to jump in real quick on that one too. I, I've done some work in the emergency service world uh, and having uh, a process in place where you don't have 50 different people doing it 50 different ways, having one person who is going to be dedicated to be able to kind of oversee it is my hope of how it's going to work to make sure that we can uh, listen to how everyone, to, to get that feedback from how the different communities are working, uh, to be able to uh, coordinate, to communicate, uh, to have that transparency to make sure that if there's something working really well in one part of the state that we can then replicate that and we need a, someone in a position to be able to say hey one I hear that well let me communicate that everywhere else uh, so my hope is that that is how it ends uh, or how it ends up working out I want to address a question here in person to Wendy over here Thank you. Um, I just want to mention we've heard a lot of uh, discussion today about um, what I fear can become sort of like these magic bullets, you know, like, oh, if we just have naloxone, oh, if we just have peer recovery specialists. And um, just to, to talk a little bit about, we're trying to build a recovery ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I get concerned, and nothing, you know, I'm so supportive of the work that Representative Baker and Representative Frederick are doing when we get too fixated on one thing and not look at it as part of the ecosystem. And we, we talked a lot about peer recovery support and peer recovery specialists, which big champion of as um, a leader of a recovery community organization. I would like to ask like Brandy and Justin and Jess and, and those people who have um, implemented peer recovery specialist programs, what else? What else is needed? We talk a lot about training a peer recovery support workforce, building that capacity. That's just the beginning. You have to change the culture. These, these, this workforce needs supportive environments in which to be placed, environments that understand recovery, that understand what peer recovery support is, that can provide that supervision. And so if um, folks I just mentioned, if you want to talk for a few seconds about what else, it's more than just training people to be peers, right? So help us understand that bigger context. All right. Um, I think it's a lot of what Wendy had mentioned is that uh, getting communities and different organizations within those communities to back it, whether that's hospitals or police, you know, those programs are great, but I don't, I'm not aware of too many in the cities where that's available, right? Um, schools, like we've mentioned. Um, and then also making sure that people are aware of what peer recovery support is and utilizing that. 
And I think it's a big part of too that what we mentioned today too is destigmatizing addiction and recovery and normalizing it so that people get the help they need. Um, you know, what I like about being in an RCO, especially the one I work at, you start to see a little of that change. Like we have peers and child and family services and justice involved settings in hospital settings, but it would be really cool. Like it's mentioned to see them anywhere where someone would need help. I think that's all I got. I think another important piece um, to that is, I mean, you mentioned support, support of uh, those, those certified peer recovery specialists that um, this, this, this is, we're pioneering this still. Um, and what does it look like to support that workforce um, as, as a person with lived experience and being in recovery and, and, and now coming alongside of someone that might be practicing harm reduction um, and as someone who uh, is abstaining, that might look different for me as an individual as well. And so what does it look like to support my own recovery? Um, what does the infrastructure that I work in and under look like? Um, what does my uh, supervision look like, right? What does my support look like um, across a team of individuals um, that is that I know I can fall back on uh, when I'm going out into the community and providing the support and things that I might encounter myself. Um, so the training, you know, our, our original or, or um, initial, excuse me, training that takes place. What does this ongoing look like um, to help build up this peer workforce to uh, be recognized as a, a professional workforce uh, that can be uh, utilized and trusted in these systems like the police station, um, like the uh, emergency room. Um, what does that team look like versus this one individual? And I don't know if I'm, I'm alluding to uh, maybe the statement that you made or question that you had, but um, for me, it's, it's really supporting, just like we wrap around and, and support the individual that we're serving. Um, we are individuals with lived experience. What does it look like to wrap around that system across the board and not sending a peer that they've been trained to know exactly what they're going in to do? And I, I usually, when I share with treatment providers, I say, well, I'm, I'm a peer and you don't know what that is. So it kind of looks like my first day of treatment where I come in and tell you what I need to do. So um, it's, it's educating the entire system of what that looks like and being part of that team, not just this piece over here, or here's this card or call them, or what does that look like to, to create a system that is incorporating? Um, Jess, I know has a wonderful example because I've heard it, so. Now I don't know if I'm gonna give that example. <laughs> Um, I just think it takes investment on the community level. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of with our program is we start peers at $47,000 a year. Um, they're city employees, they get city benefits, they get a city pension. Um, if we don't invest as a community, how the hell are we supposed to keep them? How are you supposed to keep a good peer if you pay them $14 an hour because nobody's investing in the program that's housing the peer? Um, if we want to treat this as a profession, we have to pay it as a profession and treat the people as professionals. Um, so I think we have all these cities that are getting all this money. What a great way to embed peers into the city to do outreach um, and just hire them through the city because uh, my peers seem to really love it. They like paychecks and stuff. <laughs> Representative Baker and um, Representative Frederick, um, I'm, I'm on the task force for background studies. And we just um, looked at some of the data that we've been given by DHS. And one of the things that we uh, have uncovered is that 50% of disqualifications are for substance crimes. And that's actual substance crimes, not substance related crimes. And so, and that's 15 years. 15 years, people are having, having to go back and back and back and ask for background studies. Um, and so looking at workforce and 
uh, looking at the racial disparities that we're finding. Um, it's downstream from DOC, and so it very closely reflects um, the same disparities that we see in um, public safety. Um, and so just looking to you guys um, first to just kind of share with you the work that we're doing, um, but then also like, what are your thoughts about workforce? Like, how do we, how do we, how do we change um, the fact that we need people to be peer specialists um, that have been through that. And Randy and I get calls all the time about help me, help me be a peer specialist. And, um, and there's some stuff that really is very silly um, that keeps people from being able to do that. And like, how do we rally the troops? And it isn't just substance use disorder. It's um, it's nursing homes, it's in-home care, it's foster care for families, um, it's, um, it's, it's bad. And so I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that and then a plug for next year to have your support on whatever recommendations that we make. You know, um, this is such a good point. I've heard this so many times, the background checks are so ridiculous. And, and the inspector general under the DHS has control of this. And so we, we need to get better controls. They can do a lot of things without always just legislative change. There's some things we need to do too legislatively, but there are such gray areas where they can make waivers. We did this through COVID, right? We made some exceptions and we can do that. And we did a better job during COVID to cover these things. And now there's such a backlog of background checks for all kinds of industries. We've got to fix, that's another big problem with DHS is that they've got too much coming at them. There's, there needs to be more access points to background. We've got to get answers quicker. It's so many things that we got to do, but that part of DHS and the inspector general and the licensing or the, sorry, the uh, statutes that we have to look at need to be done very, very quickly. But again, there should be a, I think it should be, if there's a, a flag that is waved on a background check, let's say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was a, an arrest for something. And this person is doing a terrific job as a pastor or someone in the field of recovery or whatever it is, put it back on new way or put it back on somebody else to say, look, you know what? We get this. You, you raise the flag. Now it's on us. All right. But, but make it that don't just say, no, you can't even work with that person. That's got to be done locally here. Right? So we've got to make changes like that. So the state isn't afraid of getting sued. That's what it really comes down to. And I can appreciate that, but you are exactly right. It's a real issue for us. Yeah. You know what, when we were talking about with, um, holistic support, right? So you were saying pure support is one piece of that, but then what, you know, what are the other pieces of that? One of the things that came out of COVID that was actually very good is we saw, you know, people being able to access supports virtually people being able to get, you know, they were able to get their needs met right in their home. Like there's a model of care out on the East Coast called AWARE. They go right into the houses and do treatment right into the right in the houses. And they have a whole wrap team that provides the family with an entire treatment eco, you know, a recovery ecosystem in the family. So I think more innovation in the technology is a big thing that's up and coming and having I don't know if this is working. Contingency management. Like we're not doing contingency management for people in recovery. And it has proven to change the neural pathways of the brain. So let's get innovative about, I think peer support is great, but like the peer support piece is what do you need? And if they need technology and they can't get it, or if they need a, a recovery group that's not 12 step and they can't get it, then the peer support specialist have to look at alternative ways to bring recovery holistic, you know, eight dimensions of wellness, recovery support to the person. And the peer support is the li liaison for that. But if there's nothing to send them to, like you said, if there's one recovery meeting in a town and it's a 12-step meeting, you know, they're kind of screwed, right? So I, I, I just have to, I have to push back on that just a little bit because 12 step did save my life. I yeah, I, I, it's, it's not bad. And, no. and I advocate for all pathways of recovery and that 12 step does work for people and it doesn't work for some people. And so they're not screwed if there's only a 12 step you know, meeting in their, in their community. Right. Let me tell you that Minnesota is the land of the Minnesota model 12 step. And you can find an AA and a non meeting in any city, but if, no, we need more options to all meetings. So that's, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, yeah. Yeah. I'm not 
insane, right? Like creative solution. Well, I feel like we could talk about this for a really long time. I want to be respectful of people's times. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to all the panelists for joining us this evening. I think this conversation was amazing. I hope we can all carry some of it uh, out into our daily lives. Thank you all for joining on Zoom. And before we end, I think there's a question online about um, how to support somebody that's struggling or using or a message of hope. So if we could just go down the line and like a 15 second message of hope and inspiration because um, to wrap things up. So Jess, if you want to start. <laughs> oh, no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think all of the time that folks like us sharing our stories, um, that we were there, we were in the thick of it and came out and recovery is real. And now we have all these years of sobriety and I have kids that have never once seen me under the influence. Um, and broke that generational just like trauma. Um, I think that's that's what gets people into recovery, not hearing the horror stories, not hearing about how many people died this year. Um, people reach out for help when they know it's possible. Yeah, I agree. Um, hearing other people's stories, knowing that there's hope, even if you only have a sliver inside and then getting connected with the right people that are willing to listen and help you guide you through that. Yeah, I would always say if you're still alive, if you're still breathing, then there's so much hope. Um, and, and just let us know how we can help. I think it's important just listen and just be in there. And, you know, I mean, everybody where they're at. And, uh, and yeah, there's recovery is possible. I just say for anyone that, that loves someone who may be struggling, it's, it's three things. It's, it's love them, you know, listen to them, listen to them being a big part. Uh, and don't give up on them. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, I couldn't echo more. Um, if 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 you're breathing, there is a chance, and there is one hundred percent anything is possible. Um, and if we remove how we believe the path looks like to get there, um, there's there's a possibility. Ryan stole mine, but here's the ad. <laughs> Um, hurt people, hurt people, and healed people, heal people. So as a family member, start with your own healing and work on that part first, and you will pass recovery on. You can pass recovery on. Yeah, when you have somebody that you love that you know is in trouble, especially as a family member, what really is important is to remember, you know, this disease is not who they are and know that they're just trying to get alive. They're just trying to get through this. So we heard so many things today, uh, try to come to where they are, but there's always hope and everybody is worth it. And, and we just have to make sure they know they're loved and that they are cared for. And I don't like the behavior that this disease is doing right now, but I love you so much. We're there for you. I, I again, I go back to uh, Barbara, your mom, Ryan, and how she was, she, oh, is she, okay, good. Barbara, again, I think your son's a pretty cool guy. And um, how you were that rock for you the whole time. And when I listen to that, I can't say that I was always there for my dad, my son, Dan, because I didn't understand this disease. And God bless you for having her because you always knew that phone bill would be paid for. And you always knew that you could have her there. And so just never, ever, ever, ever give up on these folks that are struggling and need help. And it may not be tomorrow, they're not ready for it, but, but we have to be there and know that they always have somebody that loves them unconditionally. So thanks mom for keeping them around. I guess I kind of understood it as a, a couple different ways is the, how I thought uh, when I heard the question. And one is that if it's someone who's listening right now and struggling, uh, you are not your disease. Uh, you are worthy of every piece of investment uh, in yourself that you're able to make. Uh, to someone who's listening, who has someone in their lives uh, that they care about, uh, I go back to the phrase of that, that Brandy said, meet them where they're at. That is such a powerful thing. I remember sitting on a unit in St. Peter, for those that don't know, it's, it's the maximum security psych hospital. And I was just sitting out there and there was a patient that came up and just sat next to me and didn't say a word, but we just shared space. Cause then in that moment, that's all he needed. And he, and he came up and he followed up with me later on. And sometimes 
words aren't necessary and that's that's good enough. Uh, so meeting someone where they're at is is some of the most powerful things we can do too. That's great. Thank you. Thank you again to the panel for being here and showing up. We appreciate it. Thank you all the audience. Thank you on Zoom land. We really appreciate it. <laughs>